and the buy rounds are over and it's a great place to stop and see how all the teams are looking. You have the Swans rolling at the top of the table. You have, on the other end, North building at the bottom. And speaking of that, we'll be talking later about over the next five years, who will be the strongest teams? Who are really building the most at the moment? Let's jump into the top five players of the round. I think the fifth best player of the round this week, and I just had to give someone from this team a mention, was Sam Durham. Oh, you love him, don't you? I really love Sam Durham. He's had. I'm not the only one that does because I love him for good reason. He's had a breakout year, and he was he was a mid season recruit, um, mature age kind of for Essendon, uh, and he has just been outstanding this year. And he has sort of been symbolic of that entire Essendon emergence this year. And along with Jai Caldwell and obviously Zach Merritt in that midfield, they were amazing today against West Coast. And I think Sam Durham was the best of it, just explosive. Well, there was another guy from the Essendon Bombers I think stood out, was Jake Stringer. Mm. Five goals, 20 touches, 10 score involvements, a goal assist, and five clearances from, from the middle as well. He's, he's awesome when he's in playing in the last year of his, of his contract. We've talked <laughs> yeah. about it before. Yep, yep. Keep him on a one-year contract. He seems to really have a great years when, 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 that, when that happens. But yeah, had a really good game. Sort of took it away from West Coast. And yeah. For sure. And number four, I've got Patrick Cripps. Uh, 41 disposals. Was a beast inside with 14 clearances and 18 contested possessions. Uh, he often has these big games, in, especially in big games for Carlton. He has these sorts of performances. I could guess that you'll be talking about him in a second, but he he was absolutely awesome. Uh, my number four, I had Errol Gordon. And you know what I love is we were at the game at the at the Giants Stadium, and it's the effort to get the touches. Like the fact that he'll run 60 metres just to take the mark. And what I've done is I've actually looked at his heat map, and I'm going to put it right in front of you here, because he doesn't just play on one wing. He sort of plays wherever the ball is. He's not on ball. He's on each wing. He's an he's an attacker, attacking winger. He's a defending winger. You'll think there might be three of him on the field at one time. Suddenly he's he's uh, stopping the ball on the goal line, defending, and then he's kicking a goal down the other end. Just have a look at this heat map. There's touches on both sides. It's crazy. I've never seen such a lit up heat map. But yeah, on that, forty one disposals, um, twelve contested possessions, ten intercept possessions, two goal assists. I mean, it's just sort of what we're expecting. Three Brett Kirk medals in a row. In a row. That's best on ground in the Sydney Derby. Moving on to my number three, I also had Errol Goulden. And the only thing I'd want to add to that is just on you were mentioning his work rate. We were at the game and it's just, it's genuinely amazing to just watch him run around the ground, which we were doing at points. And he just doesn't stop running. He's always, when we have the ball, he's constantly running to get get in space and help the team move forward. And when we don't have the ball, he's always the first one back to support, there to be the extra in the pack, there to help out the defenders and help clear the ball when it goes back there. It's just awesome to have that sort of work rate. 100% a future captain as well. I don't know if you've seen the videos no of him chatting to the team, uh, like yeah. the one where he talks to Grundy. Yeah, he just goes, how are you going? He's, yeah. it's, he's just got a lot of leadership. My number three was Patrick Cripps. So yeah, 41 touches. He's, they're, they're a scary outfit when when he, Walsh, I'm sure we're going to talk about the Koning in a second, and Kerno get going. Don't know if anyone's scary to the Swans, except they're probably the scariest yeah, at the moment. We'll, we'll put it that. The, the best runner-up. Absolutely. And number two, I have Lockie Neal. Uh... This is what happens when he doesn't get tagged, and I'll leave it at that. We've said it enough this year. Aiden and I were chatting this week about the best midfielders in the comp after the Brisbane game, and you, you reckon Lockie Neal might be the best when he's not tagged. Uh, we know that he is taggable, but what he's not, we saw this sort of game. 18 contested, 37 with six tackles at 90% efficiency, and just dominated Port Adelaide's midfield, which is meant to be star-studded. Well, yeah, he was my number two as well, and all I said here, the only note is, I said he's the best player in the league untagged. Yep. Move on to the number one. I'm pretty sure we both have the same the same person. It's Tom DeConing. Highest rated champion data game of the, the entire year. 34 hitouts, 25 disposals, 20 contested possessions, 7 clearances, 10 score involvements, and a goal. And something that you said a few weeks ago is just what? Get mum on the field sorted out? Yeah. Don't need the umpires. Just get mum on the field to sort out those brotherly matchups. That was one of my favorite things this round is you compare it to some of the other brother matchups we've seen recently, like Ben Mackay and Harry Mackay were directly on each other. This one with the Deconings had a lot more heat. Mm. They were the really getting into each other. It seemed pretty personal, and I absolutely loved it. They just shook hands and smiled with each other at the end of the game, so clearly it's all it's all happy days, but I loved how, how much they got into each other. Two future stars. 100%. And speaking of future stars, let's talk about the top five teams in the next five years. Start off with my who I think is the, will be the fifth best team in the top five teams in the next five years, a lot of fives. I said Hawthorne. So they're starting to build now. They potentially are sneaky for the eight. This year, I think they might just sneak in. Percentage will play a part. 
But I think if you just look at their team, they're, they're quite a, a young side. Second youngest side in the league with an average age of 23.6. Young. And Sam Mitchell, he's a great coach. He's going to get the lads going. They've got a lot of players who are going to build. In a few years when these players reach a hun- almost like that 100, 150 games mark, got a bit more experience. Will Day is one of the best midfielders in the league already. Yeah. I think they can very, very much start to push for premierships. In my number four, I have GWS. So this one's an interesting one because they're sort of an aging side uh, a little bit with an average age of 24.2. Still like they're sort of mid-10th in the league at the moment, but they still just have a lot of young talent. Um, and I think they'll just continue to sit around the, the sort of first to sixth place sort of mark for the next few years with a potential run out of flag. In number three, I'll put the Bulldogs. Now, I think anything's possible when you have Marcus Bonson Pelly, and he's still got a few more years in him. So maybe not in five years' time, but in the next five years, I think they can really start to make a run. Aaron Norton, Jamara's only going to get better. Sam Darcy. Sam Darcy's the one I want to mention. I think I, I heard a lot of talk about they think he might become one of the best forwards, if not the best forward in the league, how he's playing now in the next few years. Yeah, we don't really see this sort of season out of a rookie tall forward. It usually takes them a lot of time to adjust. 100%. To build into their body and what he's doing already, it's, it's kind yeah. of, it's really impressive. I think if they can pin down a, a, a very, like a good key back, I think they'll be a force in the next few years. Number two, I've got Carlton. So yeah, their, their average age is slightly higher with 24.8, sixth uh, oldest in the league, except they've just got talent everywhere and Walsh is still young, Cripps has got a few more years, Kono and Mackay are gonna be playing in the next five years. I just don't see them falling off. Weedering, obviously got, he'll probably get a new contract to Carlton, he'll be there for the next five years. I just see them hanging around that top four for the, for the majority. And then Sydney, there's, there's a pretty easy option. We're the eighth oldest team in the league at 24.6, so pretty similar to Carlton. Uh, we've got young stars everywhere. We're going to see if Chad resigns, if he's going to choose flags over money. Uh, I could pick stars all over the pitch who are going to be playing for the Swans in the next five years. They're young, they're still building into their bodies, and yeah, it's going to be really incredible to see. And my number five, I have a slight difference. I have Gold Coast. I thought about them. It's difficult to view them in such a positive light after the way that they're playing at the moment, especially away from home. But when you just look at the personnel and think how they're building, that midfield is really exciting. I think they're going to become a dominant midfield in the league between Anderson, Miller, and Raul, with young Ned Moyle uh, getting getting coached by Jared Vitz in there as well. I'm telling you, he's going to be a top ruckman. Yeah, and then in the back line, you have guys like Mac Andrew and Charlie Ballard, who are young stars already. Uh, in the forward line, you've got a guy like Ben King running for the Coleman as a young key forward. I really do think that they're putting it together now with a lot... I think they have a long-term future with Damian Hardwick. They are going to be a strong team, and I think they make the top four maybe in two years' time, and they I think they have an extended run in there. Obviously, anything can happen, but I really love how this team's building. I think they're nowhere near it this year. Don't think, don't think they come close to making the eight, but I think next year and the years moving forward, they're going to be phenomenal. I spoke about them for a while because the rest of my teams are quite similar. Four GWS, talent everywhere. Yes, they're about a mid-aged team, except I think... Guys like Finn Callahan and Tom Green are going to get better. Just going to continue to lead and, and keep developing. Three, I have Hawthorne as well. Uh, we everyone in the league can see how exciting they are. They already have the capacity as such a young team to take down contenders. I reckon it's fair to say, yeah. and we see that happen regularly when they're on. Two Carlton and one the Swans, two teams that are good right now and also have young profiles. Uh, there's there's no way that they drop off too hard in the next three to five years. I like it. I like it. Well, we'll get. We'll jump back to it next year. I reckon we'll see it. We'll see how the predictions are progressing. But we'll jump into hits and misses. My miss for this week: Port Adelaide are in a scary spot, short term and long term. There is a lot of premium age, high level talent in that squad that's being wasted because they don't have a comprehensive system, and they don't have high quality ball movers outside of that midfield. They have high end talent in that midfield: Butters, Rosie. Brownlow medalist in wines, Horn Francis, who might become the best of them, Willem Drew. I don't think they have high quality movers outside of that midfield. And I think Ken Hinckley, the game's gone past him. Uh, I think that's a harsh statement, but it's it's seeming more and more true. They don't adjust. They cannot beat good teams. They have not beaten a team that's in the top eight right now this year. Uh, and uh, I, I just worry that they're not building towards anything in the future. Just referencing that previous segment this is meant to be their time and they don't look good at all i like it i like it my miss is is pretty similar another struggling side we've said it before but gold coast's inability to win away 
Honestly, they've in two weeks' time they play North Melbourne at, at Marvel Stadium. That's a massive game for them. Can they break the away game hoodoo? But Especially honestly, with how Clark's Clark Ball uh, is going around now. North, North <laughs> Clark Ball is building, <laughs> and honestly, put the house on North Melbourne to win that game. I just don't know. I don't know what it is. It must be a mental thing now. But yeah, before the season, they said the finals as a minimum, which came up from their board. I don't think they're going to hit that. They scored eighty percent of the Premiership squad, which is probably true if yep. they win a Premiership in the next few years. But I just, if they can't win games away, they can't exactly challenge for a premiership. Yep. My hit for this week, something we saw live. We went down to Western Sydney and watched uh, the the Sydney Derby. The Swans Army took over NG Stadium. Uh, I do have to say, and we were talking about this, the atmosphere at the stadium and the entertainment put on by the the GWS people was awesome. Uh, Every player has their own song when they score a goal. I loved Josh Kelly's GWS making a fourth quarter comeback. Josh Kelly snaps a goal and you get X goal, give it to you. It was very, very hype. We were getting into it. <laughs> it, was, it was really, really good. Makes you root for players in a, in a different sort of way. They also had the siren uh, the, for the orange tsunami. The tsunami siren. Orange tsunami warning. It was, it was yeah. awesome. Uh, but it was a pretty much a Swans home crowd. My favorite yeah. moment of the round, I mentioned one of my favorites earlier, but my favorite moment... Toby Green, the, the home ground captain being booed in his own stadium by 80% of the crowd because it was just pretty much a home crowd. And I will say the biggest cheer of the entire game was when Toby Green hit the post. Fourth quarter, Toby Green hits the post. Yeah, 100%. My hit was the top eight competition for places. So there's six points between fifth place and 13th. There are some teams starting to peak in the Hawks, the Dogs, the Lions. And there is quite a few teams struggling for form in GWS, Geelong, Port Melbourne and Gold Coast. But they're still alive, and any of these teams can make the top eight. And it's it, it's just like good. From we're sitting at the top, but seeing a bit of competition below us for places. Yeah, it's just as so, a neutral. So you just sort of think as a Swans fan, how's the weather down there? It looks a bit volatile. Okay, it's, it's pretty calm up here. Twenty five and sunny. Let's move on to the <laughs> footy pyramid. So the footy pyramid, not a lot of changes because most of the guys in my team had buys, and I didn't think they deserved to be taken out. But, yeah, there's no outs. There's no new wins. We'll start at the fifth tier. Walsh holds his spot. Max Gorn moves down a tier. Will Day holds his spot. Liberatore holds his spot. And Sicily holds their spot. Moving up to the fourth tier, Sarong moves down a tier. Lockie Neal moves up a tier. Kerno holds his spot in the fourth tier. And Zach Merritt holds his spot in the fourth tier. To into the third tier, Nick Dacos holds his spot. Chad Warner, I believe, deserved to hold his spot. Got tagged and still get two goals and 20 disposals. And Paddy Cripps had a really good game. He moves up one, one tier. In the second tier, nothing changes. Errol Gordon and Marcus Bontempelli. But the gap is closing to Heaney. So I think in the next couple of weeks, we could see someone else on top. But yeah, that's the footy pyramid. You see it in front of you here. Let me know if you want to make any changes. On to the power rankings. This is not a drill. North Melbourne are off of 18th in the power rankings. Richmond move in. They're actually not in horrible form, but Clark Ball, North Ball, whatever you want to call it, it's building and it's awesome to see them be consistently competitive. I think every AFL fan is starting, is loving what they're seeing with North. And I just wish LDU didn't spoil um, Paul Curtis. Paul Curtis, thank you. Oh gosh, just for him to have that shot after the siren. And then Simkin just out. could have picked up the ball oh. and kicked it. He had a bit of time. But Everyone's yeah. rooting for North just to take down your enemies. As soon so. as they got their first win, I don't mind how many wins they get now. Exactly. And but they they sit in seventeenth. Uh, and but both of these teams are now competitive. I think we have for the first time in a couple seasons. I think we have eighteen competitive teams right now. Richmond and North have both hit a bit of form, and we know what West Coast can do, especially with Reed and Yo in the side. Sixteenth West Coast. Just mentioning them, it was great to see Oscar Allen and Jake Waterman playing together uh, for the first time this season. Now, that I think they're both premier forwards of the league that are, that are only getting better. Adelaide in 15th with the bye. St Kilda in 14 also with the bye. And then in 13, we have Gold Coast. It's just so confusing to know where to put them because I have them in 13, but then next week, I'm pretty sure they're at home. And I they've got Collingwood at home. I expect them to win. Like, it's so confusing and right now. North Melbourne away. Expect them to lose. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you can't... I, I say this every week. Sure, we expect them to do well at, at Collingwood, uh, against Collingwood next week and defend their fortress, but I'm not going to put you any higher than this when you can't win an away game. I like it. In 12th, Port Adelaide. I've ranted about them earlier. Not going to speak much longer, but they are going to have to scratch and claw to make the top eight this year when they had much loftier expectations. Next, we have Geelong. Just in awful form. 
since they, they started the season 6-0, and didn't they? And yeah. since then, they have two wins from eight games. Yeah. Uh, just getting just getting pounced every week. Their midfield just doesn't have the firepower, doesn't have the talent. And Dangerfield's going to miss another week. Absolutely. Dangerfield was back and they still just got dominated, you do have to say, by one of the strongest midfields in the league in Carlton. Mm. Uh, but Walsh, Cripps, uh, Hewitt, they were just getting out the front and Tom DeConing, just getting out the front of the stoppage regularly. Uh, Geelong not making much of a fight in the midfield and just got got slapped this week. Next up is Melbourne, who just hung on to a win against North Melbourne and yet they jumped three spots. Is that right? Mm, yeah. Just shows that sort of the teams that I've got just below them there in Geelong, Port and Gold Coast all had shockers this week. They all had shockers and they all just dropped below Melbourne. So Melbourne clung on to a win to jump a couple of spots ahead of those guys. Next up, we have Fremantle. And this was a return to form. But as we've spoken about, we don't know what we're going to get from them. It's scary as a Fremantle fan. Uh, They need to find some consistency, especially in that forward line. Um, But they were strong today. Next up, we have GWS. We know what they can do, but there's been a lot of talk about their offense. Was there anything you wanted to say about that? Well, no, they just ran into a Sydney side. They ran into a Sydney side this week, except since their hot start in rounds one to seven, uh, in the seven games since, they're scoring 42 less points per game. I like that stat. Yeah, they're they're scoring seven less goals per game total, and their defense has been about the same as it was on that hot start. Mm -hmm. So they need to be scoring more goals. We saw that orange tsunami that everyone was talking about, which was so real. Just every time GWS were transitioning, it was like the entire team was charging forward, like total football with the Netherlands. It was it the seventies and the eighties. Yeah. It was it was like it was like the AFL equivalent of that. And we're just not seeing any of that anymore. It's the same sort of personnel. They don't have a big injury list, so they're gonna Adam Kingsley's gonna have to cook something up in the training ground to re inspire that offense. Next up, we have Essendon, and look, they're playing good footy. Uh, they got a win against West Coast here. I'd like to see them put up strong performances against good teams. They've done it a couple times. Got that win against GWS earlier in the year, but I think this is about where they sit. Next up, we have the Bulldogs, who are one of those teams on a hot run outside the eight, sitting in, I think, uh, ninth or 10th now, and they have every reason to jump into the eight. Good percentage, decent run home, and I really do think that they'll make the eight. Um, They're looking good, and they look to have found some consistent football. Scoring goals, even with two of their best forwards are uh, injured. Next up, we have Brisbane, who continue their hot streak. And uh, you have to pay credit to Chris Fagan, who never really had any worries earlier in the year when Brisbane started 0-4 and, 0 and, 4 and yeah. were just... It, it was danger signs all over. But he said, hey, we know what we're doing. We know that we can fix these issues. This is not a personnel issue that we can't fix. And they look like a top four side. And they found a super forward in Hipwood. They- I don't know what happened there. He's... They also found one in Kai Loman. He wasn't even half the player in the previous years, but yeah, awesome player. Seriously, he's, he's on fire, Eric Kipwood. He cops a lot of flack from people like ourselves, mm. uh, but he's proving it all wrong. In the top four of the power rankings, we have Collingwood, who uh, who sit there with a buy that was well-timed. Uh, they, like Sydney, have a very nice buy fixture for this season. Really tough fixture next week, Gold Coast away. One of the toughest fixtures Genuinely, in the competition. Yeah. Pretty much unwinnable. They should just rest all their good players, just cop the loss and and prepare for the next week. In third, we have Hawthorne. Uh, You just love that they continue continue to fly. Uh, A buy round this week and they deserve to hold their spot. And then in two, Carlton continue to go, dominate Geelong and uh, I think separating themselves from the rest of the pack. Clearly the best second team. Separating themselves from the rest of the pack as the contender. And then number one, Sydney Swans. Can't put a foot wrong. Uh, Andrew Gay has said on the start of bounce this week doesn't think they'll lose a game for the rest of the season <laughs> and, they, and they've got the ability now to rest players as well but I mean if you're if you're John Longmire I don't think Heaney or Warner or Gould will just, allow themselves to be rested I'm just thinking that now because coaches I reckon, association I reckon, I reckon he'll bring it up right because they'll, they'll have guys Mills is going to come back Parker's going to come back they'll have the ability to rest the guys and like they want to peak around September and finals yep. but they're not going to want to rest I mean, if Goulden continues playing like this, he's going to storm home in the Brownlow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't think they will rest. I think they're too hungry. 
Yeah, for, that, for these that was my thought as well. You saw we were talking we were talking about it during the game. The way that Chad Moore was trying to burst through packs and kick goals from fifty in the fourth four, quarter. Four guys in front of him. He takes the ball. <laughs> yeah. and He just tries to take it on. Get I the think umpires to notice. Once the game was over, he may have been thinking about those end of season awards. hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. So, so I think it'll be tough for Longmire to convince those guys to take a risk. Longmire can't get the golden off the ground once in a game, let alone for a full game. So I don't think that's happening. Uh, so this is where the power rankings sit. I'm pretty happy with this. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And we'll see you on the next one.